Hey, welcome back to our Bandwagon fans. This is Jeff, and I am joined once again by my friend, Scott Grissel. Thank you. And we are again on location here at Creatista Studios. Uh, before we get started, I just want to thank all of my returning subscribers, all my new subscribers, and all of Scott's friends that are going to end up watching this show. So, Yay, Scott's um, friends and subscribers yeah. and all those people. It's always fun to see new people subscribe, and if you if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that button below the video, and hopefully you'll like our discussion and you'll like the video as well. And be sure to leave your comments. Uh, this this could turn into a very interesting conversation. So Scott, real quick, do you want to say anything you want to say about yourself or kind of what you do here? Um, well, you're here at our studio in South Tucson, um, and we do. Um, as our company name implies, we do filmmaking, video, and photography. So I'm a commercial photographer, uh, filmmaker, <coughs> excuse me, typically work in uh, documentary form, although I do some narrative stuff from time to time, the sorts of things that literally tens of people have seen, <laughs> so I'm like that famous. And, uh, it's kind of like this channel right now. <laughs> and you're actually here in our, this is the yeah. studio, which we repurpose yeah. uh, for both still and motion shoots. Yeah. So. Awesome, um, phenomenal photographer. If you get a chance to, uh, I'll put a link to your to your website Thanks. below. And if you get a chance, go check it out. And if you're in Tucson, uh, hire this guy, and then eventually you'll hire me Please. too. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, so tonight we are going to be talking about Tully. So it's uh, two guys drinking beer and talking about a pregnant woman. Which, yeah. So um, that scares me a little bit. Yeah, frankly. it is scary. Yeah. So putting that out on the internet. Yeah. So just a, a little uh, a caveat. You know, we're both um, we're both pretty progressive men, um, and I think, but we, I think we both acknowledge that we have we have our blind spots. Mm -hmm. And this movie, the discussion we're about to have, very well could hit our blind spots. Um, go ahead and leave your comment if you see that below. But we're we could hit some third rails of things that could get us in trouble, but uh, understand that we're both coming from uh, we're both coming from a pretty uh, uh, heartfelt and um, peaceful place. Just sometimes perspectives change. So uh, um, that that's all going to be in text. It'll be right under the video. We need you to sign it yeah. before we watch this. So with that being said, <laughs> so this is Tolly. This is uh, starring Charlie Theron um, and John Livingston as her husband. She is a uh, woman who is just going on maternity leave, about ready to have her third child, an incredibly stressful, hectic life with two children already, a job, a marriage, and she has the third child, and they hire a night nanny. Um, I said in my, oh, real quick, this, this is, is going to be a spoiler discussion. I've already done, I've already done the non-spoiler review, so we are just if we're going to talk about whatever we feel like talking about okay they hired they hired they end up hiring a night nanny and i did not know this thing existed yeah I did you know a night nanny was a thing i still don't know i, I, I didn't i'm not actually sure i was thinking on the way whether a, a night nanny is just a contrivance for this film or if it's actually something real so maybe if, somebody will school us if it wasn't real it will be now yeah, that's somebody, right. somebody, somebody is somebody's is, hiring a, a yeah. night nanny right now. Yes. Um, so, so she hires this night nanny, and the movie. Um, again, we're going to get it. We will get into spoilers, but the, the premise the, the movie presents is that you know a woman who is always taking care of other people, and what happens when there's somebody to take care of her. So with that being said, this is the second time I've seen it. I've already done the, my non-spoiler review. I'm going to turn it over to Scott, and I'm curious what you, what your overall interpretation is, what you think the primary themes are of this movie featuring a pregnant woman with, with now three kids. Yeah, thanks for giving me that heavy load to carry <laughs> on this movie. I think we were saying before we started rolling that... Um, you know, it's not an, it, it's in a lot of ways, it's not necessarily an easy movie to pin down, and it's not necessarily a movie where the, where the themes are clear cut. Mm. It's, so it's, it's working on many levels. Yeah, and so I really liked it yes. on that level. I mean, yeah, really I thought it was really yeah. good. And um, I, I've had, I, I have one son, so I lived through a time that was similar to those first few months or so with our son, and I thought that, I thought that the movie 
did a really good job of sort of capturing just how sort of um, just like how sort of crazy kind of that time is because it's such a different time in your life. And of course, she she had two kids in addition. One of the kids has some developmental things going on, so he's a challenge. Um, so a couple things that I I, I found to be themes in this. Um, one of them was that um, between a woman's 20s and 30s to that woman, because this is only the story of one woman, I can't generalize this out to everybody, but to that woman, who's played by Charlize Theron, um, like she has radically lost something. And, and she's not even sure what it is that she's lost, but she's become very shut down to um, just to life in general and depressed and her world has <coughs> has moved from a focus of being this big to a focus of being this big. And so there's a pivotal question, which actually sort of gets answered later in the movie, maybe, for her, like, is that okay? Is that okay for her that at this point in her life, like her focus has narrowed down to this? And will she ever have the opportunity to have her focus widen back out? So are you, are you thinking it's more about like the dreams of youth and how they get challenged by adulthood? And I do they, think there's, lost? yeah, okay. I don't think that's the only thing, but I do, I definitely think that there is. It's, it can't be the only thing, because I didn't read that at okay. all. Right, right. <laughs> I'm not, but you're probably, I think there's, you're definitely what you're saying has some validity, but it's not what I saw at all. I mean, she's lost her sex life, she's lost her just sort of, I mean, she, she makes a comment and one point about, like, this other woman's butt, this woman who's, like, pivotal to the movie, and it's like, well, you know, I remember when I was built, like, you. I remember when I acted like you. Um, I remember when I was you. I remember when I was you. I remember when I was you. There's a lot of that. And she clearly is like grieving the fact that that's not her and she's not really accepted sort of what she has moved into. When she looks in the mirror, um, she's not feeling good about that. So do you, so, well, I'm I'm not going to play cat and mouse here. My overall interpretation of the movie is that it is a, and it's for anybody that knows me, the, the fact that I'm going straight Marxist shouldn't surprise anybody, but I saw this as not a story about pregnancy at all. This was a critique of modern society, particularly the effects of modern society on the physical and mental well-being of poor people. Yeah, I totally got that. And, yeah. and, and one of the things that really bugged me, as much as I love the movie, is that the house that they lived in was not right for the role. Too big or? It was too... just, it was too nice. Yeah. It didn't, because to me, the house that they lived in didn't make the points. Now somebody made, an, made a conscious decision, but I looked at that house and thought, wow, in California or I... on the East Coast, that would be like, you know, a million too. Right, and I, I don't, I, I, I see where you're going, I, I understand what you're pointing out, but I'm, gonna, I'm actually thinking it was an appropriate choice because it highlights one of the critiques of, of this hyper-capitalist modern society is that it doesn't matter what you have. There's always the need to feel like you need more. Right. So these are two people that are, have, that are professionals, have careers in, they're in some form of New York. They might be in New Jersey. I'm not sure if it's clear on that. Right. I think they are in New Jersey. Yeah. So. Or son, no, wait. License plate on the car said New York. New York, you're right. She had a New York license. Yeah. So they, they're, they're well to do, and I think they're well to do enough to afford this house but they're not as well to do as right. Charlie Theron's brother in this movie is incredibly is incredibly wealthy right and that's um, and has a very picture perfect family yes. which is probably less perfect than I mean, yeah. you get one little insight into the fact that that family may be less perfect than than yeah. it it portray is portrayed I, you know I remember hearing um, about people buying lofts in Tribeca with their families and getting three nannies, one for each kid, because the neighbors had 
a nanny for each one of the kids. And even the idea of a night nanny, it's kind of absurd in a way. Yeah. Like that you would need that and that actually there's a there's sort of a richer person who says, well, she's judging our decision to have a night nanny, you know. Um, so yeah, I uh, the I got it as like straight up economic criticism at yeah. some point. I mean, it turns out that the school that she really wants to have her kid in is not nearly as good a school as the public school, mm -hmm. which she figures out later because they don't really accept her. Right. There. They say they do. They say, oh, we love your family. They say we love your family like three times, but they don't. So there, there's one thing I really wanted to get your perspective okay. on, and I really wish we had a woman here to talk about this. Um, but as a photographer, so one of, one of the big themes in the movie, one of the recurring themes is the difference between this outward self that you have to present to other people, which is generally unhealthy and um, de deleterious to, to your well-being, versus the self-care you need just to be, just to be who you are and your grotesque, flatulent self. Right. Um, with that being said, I kept thinking, watching this movie, I kept thinking back to this trend of maternity photography. And this idea that we've we've kind of we've gotten to a point where feminism or women's rights is in in some circles is almost about putting women on a pedestal, and this idea that treating women like a goddess rather than being something that honors women and respects women is putting a burden on women that sometimes they quite frankly don't want anything any part of. Um, so with all that big setup, do you? Do you think there's anything potentially harmful in this trend of maternity photography and, and creating an unreal expectation on, on women? Yeah, well, I mean, it's hard as a photographer because we're definitely, we're complicit in all that stuff. You know, yeah. I just did a series of photos fairly recently and, you know, somebody, you know, I asked the people and they said, okay, you know, thin up my arms, you know, yeah. so yeah. You know, Photoshop something, fixed, we... you know, fixed teeth. I yeah. mean, it's, and it's, so it's something that we do. Um, I, I think that there's been a, just a trend in general. I don't know if it's just with maternity photography, but that, and this is nothing new, but it is sort of creating that sort of perfect image. Like in the movie, Charlize Theron's brother's wife is picture perfect. Yeah. I mean, she is like magazine cover she, beautiful. Yeah, and she and she has the line. Oh, my my third my third pregnancy at the end was I almost couldn't go to the gym. Right. She almost couldn't go to right, the gym. Right. Right. Charlize right. Theron just rolls her eyes like you bitch. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I think they did a great job in the movie of like she in some ways was a mirror for Charlize Theron's character whose hips are big and they show like she has stretch marks and um, for her to be looking at this other woman and compare, well, I mean, I think that probably happens. So I think it happens to guys too. I mean, I see guys on the cover of a magazine, they on the cover of Men's Health magazine. And I think, well, you know, what the, the I work out. You know, they, I don't look like that. They hint at that actually. The difference between uh, John Livingston, Charlie's husband, and. Charlie's brother, there is a rivalry there, right. uh, but it's not about looks, it's about wealth. It's about status. money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's definitely about money. Um, I think that the, uh, like the, the, it, it's interesting because I think the character that Charlene, Charlize Theron's character throughout the movie was really beautiful. Like, I mean, yeah. at every sort of step of the way, like they didn't do, like they didn't go down this road, and I'm really glad they didn't, of making her look like she looked in Monster. Like they, they weren't, it, they weren't trying to create such a chasm. I think what they were almost saying is like, in a way, like she isn't really seeing this, even in herself, so she couldn't recognize some of that. And there are a couple of places in the movie where she it actually starts to kind of break through a little bit and she participates in that sort of like sort of self-acceptance a little more than she had earlier on. And it, it's this nice sort of reciprocal or it's kind of circular thing where she feels a little better about herself. 
So you said you throughout the movie you thought she looked beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that leads into something else, um, the, the male gaze. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure you are already familiar with what the male gaze is, but just a, a primer for the audience. Uh, the male gaze is a, um, in, within feminist film critique, it's an idea that all movies are made from a male point of view. And the men, the male characters in movies are um, aspirational objects. They're, they're the people that men aspire to be, and women are just objects of desire. Right. Um, so saying that she's beautiful in this, in this movie, I actually took it as the movie is actually saying, I don't give a fuck if I'm beautiful or not. Mm -hmm. Stop putting that on me. Right. I'm. I really just want to sleep. Uh huh. I just want to go to sleep. Right. And I'm not saying. I, I'm not saying that the movie was specifically trying to present her as beautiful. Yeah. I just. I have a pretty wide range when it comes to people. Yeah. What I consider to be sort of a. Tr I mean, I think most people are good looking, and most people are interesting to look at, and most people have interesting faces, and people have. In it's probably part of it's being a photographer. People yeah. have interesting bodies. They move in interesting ways, and. Um, it is fascinating when people discover that in themselves in one way or another. It just changes like the little thing of like how like it's a millimeter with the shoulders. You know, when the shoulders come up just a little bit higher, it's like you can just see that that sort of confidence comes out. So um, there were a lot of scenes in this movie where she was not portrayed as what I would consider to be sort of classically beautiful Charlize Theron, who is classically beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, she she sort of fits that, and she had to sort of play against that character a little bit. But um, you really care for her in this yeah. movie. I mean, you were, it's not something, it could have got, it felt to you. I, I haven't seen the trailer yet, and you told me you would wanted to show me the trailer because you, you well, t tell me what yeah, you told so me about the trailer. I, I, wa I wanted to show you the trailer before we saw the movie, and I totally spaced that out. Um, the trailer made it look like it was all about the, the, the trials and tribulations of a woman being pregnant and having a kid, and then it also strongly implied that she discovers her lesbian side with this night nanny. We really haven't even talked much about the night nanny yet. Yeah, but we should. We, yeah, we absolutely have Because to. that is the, um, the M, I think if M. Night Shyamalan made a movie about pregnancy, it would be this movie. And I leaned over and the one time I talked, spoke to you in the movie yeah. was when I figured out what was going on. So did you figure it out yet? Yeah, or pretty you, much. You were, yeah. I, and I was five minutes before that, I was going, okay. I need to see if this woman interacts with anybody. She did, though. Well, kind, but she didn't really. She, did, we know she didn't really, but right. okay. So, um, there's two. So I, had, I, had, all right, we'd already talked about the trailer a little bit. Um, so the the twist of the movie, and you mentioned M. Night Shyamalan. I immediately thought of Fight Club. I don't okay. know. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's it's the exact the same, same twist as Fight Club. Same conceit. Same exact conceit. Yeah. Yeah. So the Night Nanny doesn't exist. It's yeah. actually Charlie Theron's 26 year old self right. that she's projecting out in the real world, which means all the phenomenal stuff that the Night Nanny is doing at night is Charlie Theron doing and not sleeping. Right. Which, which again, goes to what I think was the theme of modern society, grinding people to a husk. Right. Absol um, absolutely. I mean, in this film, you don't realize it until later on, but she has, like, separated that personality out, yeah. projected it, made it real so that she can talk to it, and when that personality says, I need to leave now, I'm just here to bridge a gap, then it's actually kind of disastrous at that point yeah. because she's still kind of relying on that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, she's still, yeah. Um, because what she's, what she's doing is physically impossible. No human right. can do what she's doing. And, I, and um, I went, in my earlier review, I said, you could, you, could, you could make this exact same movie and the main character is a professional wrestler. Mm -hmm. or a businessman or any, anybody, any American can understand um, 
just how difficult it is to work eight to 12 hours a day, then go home and raise a family, and then, you know, you know, entertain your, your neighbors or whatever. And try to live up to then that sort yeah. of picture. And, and, you, and you see your neighbors and you think, my neighbors have it together, right. they're doing this, so I gotta, I gotta keep up with the Joneses. Right. And not, not understanding that the Joneses are looking at you like, I gotta keep up with the Smiths, and right. it's like this, this arms race of trying to keep up with your neighbor right. and really everybody the movie should have been called i need some damn sleep already yeah um yeah so there so there was that whole there was the twist of finding out the, the um um the night nanny did not exist it, it was it was just it was just a ego projection yeah ego projection um and that it was the first time i saw it it was the one it was the one issue i had with the movie is that I thought it? Um, I thought it used her mental illness as a cop out. You know, it's not society. It's not unrealistic expectations that are put on her. She can't live up to the expectations because she's ill. Right. After thinking about it, I think. I think what they were, what the movie was really trying to say is, those unrealistic expectations are what is what's causing her mental illness. Right. And, and it, it was interesting because. If you tracked with the narrative of the movie and you didn't and you weren't paying or you hadn't noticed at some point that the night nanny didn't interact really with the rest of the family or whatever. So you weren't you were thinking it was a classic narrative where mm -hmm. the, you see a person who's real, the person's real, right? Right. Then there were certain things along the way where you say, Well, the Charlize their own character, she's kind of getting a break. And I, I thought one of the most sort of poignant moments had to do with cupcakes. Yeah. Because there's this moment where Charlize Theron says to the night nanny, who is her ego projection, mm -hmm. you know, people do these cupcakes of minions. Yeah, she said... Right? And they look beautiful. The night nanny had said, you're a great mother. And she right. said, great mothers make cupcakes for their for you know, minions for right. their class. Charlize Theron goes up and goes to sleep. Wakes up in the morning, that and I'm going to compress two nights, but the house is clean. Yeah. So the house is clean, and there are minion cupcakes, and they're like amazing, not fail minion cupcakes. Right. So if you follow the classic narrative, the helper provided her with something, which she then sent in with the son, and she had a little win, and the kid says, my, my mother, mother made, made these cupcakes. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I thought, well... If, if the night nanny was real, like, you know, the mom should have said the night nanny, but the night nanny's not real. By this time, some people are probably starting to kind of figure it out. I don't think many people are figuring it out. Early on. I heard yeah. a couple of people gasp when the reveal came. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, what you, realize, what you realize when you look back is that she's sinking deeper and deeper, and she's buying, Charlize Theron is buying the model, and she's trying to make sort of some some progress with like the school and stuff like that by sending in these cupcakes when the thing that she really needs to do is pull her kid out of that damn school and send her to the school where the people really love them yeah which actually does happen later yeah. so um watching it a second time and knowing what the twist was completely different perspective there were there were so many little lines that were tells right um where it's like oh where the first time you watch it, you think it is what you, like you said a classic narrative but the second time um realizing how all the all like all the tells um and the double meanings of, of their interaction with each other right i still haven't figured out so there, there's one scene where the night nanny puts on um she, she's asking Charlie's about about John's fantasies, and one of one of his fantasies is uh, like a, a diner waitress. Right. And then she puts on the diner waitress outfit, and this is the night nanny and Charlie's both go up to the bedroom and right. have sex. Right. With him, and that's the one time where you see him, the, the husband, interact with the night nanny. Um, and obviously, it's a reference to the the need to perform sexually. Um, no matter what circumstances uh, a woman is in. Um, but I, I don't quite understand what the Night Nanny's role in that was, if well, she I, didn't exist. I, I can tell you what I think was going on was basically that 
the husband, I mean, he never saw the night nanny. Right. I mean, obviously, because right. she, she doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. And so she was just, because she talked about all of the impediments to sex. Like, you know, we just, what did she say? It's like, it's like we both decide we want to go out to eat, but we can't decide on what re restaurant to go to. Yeah. And then eventually he puts his headphones on and plays video games. And so the younger her says, well, maybe what you need to do is... You know, you need to try something a little different. What are his fantasies? So she then uses the younger self. She puts her right in front of herself, and she and but she is clearly enjoying it, which was a very strange sort of thing. If you thought it was a traditional narrative, that should have been a clue that something wasn't exactly tracking, because then she just takes this this young woman and pretty much sets her right on her husband. And but she's I, clearly I, in, I, enjoying that sort of. The first time I saw it, I didn't I didn't catch on that she was fake. Uh -huh. And I thought there was enough comments in the, early in the movie about Charlie Theron being pretty um, promiscuous or liberal, right. se sexually liberal in her younger self. Sex positive. Yes. Um, so that it wasn't at that point in her life, I could buy her one being open to it right. and actually. It, it, Kind of in her, in her own way, living out her own fantasy. Right. So I, I, the first time I saw it, I didn't realize she, she was fake until the actual reveal, until the car accident. Um, so I don't, I don't think it was as much of a tell. You know, some I, I said in my review, some people are going to claim that they figured out earlier, but you know, maybe. Yeah, I, you know, the night nanny was too perfect. In too, there were like, she was, I, when I realized that everybody else seemed pretty real, but the night nanny didn't. That was yeah. the first sort of clue to me. It's like, no, there's two, like nobody enters your life this perfectly. Yeah. yeah and that was sort of what I started to kind Mary of. Mary Poppins. Yeah, well. So, so, so there was, uh, I figure what show I was watching. You know, Mary there, Poppins yeah. is a real, right? Well, the whole, the whole movie. Right, okay, just check it. Yeah. So, penguins. <laughs> um, so one other thing I wanted to, I wanted to talk about, and there, there, there's so many things to talk about in this movie. It is so, it is so densely layered. Um, but the, the whole mermaid theme, um, what, was your, what was your interpretation of, of the mermaid imagery, and when did you form that? Yeah, well, you notice it, I mean, because there are some mermaid things that have, like, there's a show on TV, and they're, like, doing mermaid fashion, and there are... It, there was a very specific, well, I'll come back, come back to that moment, Okay. but, but there's, it, was, it was framed in a very specific way, which I noticed the second time. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't it, when, I, when I stepped out, it, yeah. was, it was to put a note on my phone to come back to that point. Oh, okay. Oh, good. But go ahead. Yeah, go. so, um, yeah, yeah um... I, I, I'm not sure that I have fully, like, um, that I've, I've processed the whole mermaid thing. It was really fascinating, but mermaids are, are mythic, um, and, you know, any time, sort of, you know, maybe if you're doing anthropology and I'm thinking psychology, any time, you know, you go into sort of union space, anything that's under that's below the surface is like what's below the surface. And, um, you know, the mermaid was um, just kind of, uh, just kind of free and freeing. So, I'm, I mean, I, like, what I got out of it was that that was, like, her ego projection was really, like, it taken to its extreme. Like, that night nanny was that mermaid and that was her so she was kind of projecting that out and that was ultimately what saved her yeah and i think that the night nanny really saves her twice saves her once as a mermaid and saves her again in the hospital room when she says you know you know i have to go but i mean basically she tells her you have all the tools that you need to with this. So you, you could almost do an entire video, an entire discussion just about the mermaid imagery in this movie. Right. The first time we see the mermaid is just big open ocean with the mermaid swimming through it while, while Charlize is dreaming. Right. And I was like, oh, that's, and it, it just comes out of left field. And yeah, it's really strange at that yeah. point because it is a totally traditional narrative. Yeah. And it cuts to this mermaid swimming underwater. So now this isn't something somehow somewhere in human history 
mermaids became this symbol, this idealized version of female sexuality. I don't comprehend it. I have no interest in sex with fish, but somewhere along the line, that became the ideal woman. So that, in her mind... On the Odyssey, right? I mean, they're calling, the sirens are calling to them, and that's sort of the same. I don't know if those are mermaids, but that's that same sort of energy. They actually have to, like, yeah, they have to tie themselves to the mast of the ship so that they don't just go off with the mermaids. So it's just... So, and, that, and that's what the image in the movie was representing, was her, her, sub, her subconscious projection of this idealized woman. Right. And where you mentioned the TV show, there, it was actually framed uh, Ron, it was right after she had given birth. Ron Livingston was sleeping on a couch in the waiting room, and the TV with the TV show was right over his head like a thought bubble. Oh, that's so. It was like it was like his dream of oh, the yeah. perfect woman. Yeah, I mean that's I, I ran out. And of they the were all women in bikinis, yeah. kind of spinning around. I mean, it was a it was a bathing suit fashion yeah. show, like a runway kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, and they so. they were talking about like it was a mermaid thing. Right. Um, and then and then it keeps coming up, and and the big ocean with the mermaid swimming through it eventually turned into a woman drowning. Right. In the big ocean, right. so it was it was Charlize. Dram- literally dying based because of the uh, um, I, I want to say no, I'm trying to say projection but that's not the right word um, literally drowning because of the expectations placed on her right. and not just ex- not just externally but her own expectations right. one of the interesting things with the night nanny is once you realize that it's not really her all those conversations of the night nanny telling her to go have sex with her husband, that's her subconscious. Yeah. She says, why don't you talk to him? Yeah. Like at one point, the night nanny gives this sort of brilliant advice. She's like, you know, there's some stuff you guys need to deal with. Well, why don't you just talk to him? She's clearly, that's a conversation that's inside yeah. her head. And she's answering it like, well, it's scary or we don't talk well or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I think there was a lot. Yeah, of just a... Um, just a, all in all, just a yeah. fascinating movie. Go ahead. Can I just say something yeah. about men in the yes. movie? Yes. I thought we were treated a tad unfairly, just a little bit, vis a vis the two main men in the movie. And the one who was like the husband, who was a sweet guy and was trying, mm-hmm. but was so clueless. And then the sort of aspirational rich guy who was also actually a sweet guy and trying to help too. And those to me, they kind of a sweet guy, but they called, they called him an asshole several times. Um, I actually didn't see him act in a way that would have shown that, but you got that there's some backstory or just kind of a, yeah. but he thinks he knows what's right. The husband is like, he's just continuing to sort of go about his life and he hasn't made accommodation. If those are the polar, if those are the ends of the spectrum, I do think that there are men who, who fall in the middle there. And we all fall down. I mean, my probably yeah. thing when my son was young, you know, as I was probably the guy who was out traveling too much. But, you know, but there's, there's room in between those two. And maybe the one guy at the school, there was one guy, this one short scene, it was kind of out of nowhere, the one guy at the school, he might have been the guy that saved it for yeah. you. A guy who was like, okay, I'm the middle guy, right? Or e- even the son, as demanding as the son was. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. he could be. Um, this is, this, we're hitting that, we might be hitting that third rail I talked about at the very beginning. <laughs> so in a movie where a woman is, is almost killed based off of the expectations of society, and we're like, well, what about the men? But, <laughs> but your, 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 point, your point is valid. You know, I would say that the men were a little shallow. Yeah. Like, there was so much attention given to Charlize Theron so much attention given to the night nanny that I felt like the development of the men's characters yeah like it could have just it could have been one it could have been one more tick on them um because I don't know I I don't know that they were necessarily done in a way that is is truly representational 
So. Yeah. I mean, there are some men who are way worse, I'm sure, of yes. both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. So. And we know them. So. Yeah. Um, so I think I think we've there's so much to talk about in this movie, but we we do kind of have to wrap it up. Um, uh, so I just want to thank everybody for watching. If you actually made it this far, you, you sat through about 35 minutes talking about this movie by two white guys, and <laughs> one of them who right. only has cats. Right. Uh, but thanks thanks for watching. And uh, I'm Jeff Scott. Bandwagon fans, get on the bandwagon.